morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome to Atlanta. Um, it's gonna be 99 degrees today, so it's good that we're in here where the, the air conditioning is, and I think we're gonna have a, a great day and a half. Um, just by word of sort of introduction as to who I am, I'm Georgina Peacock, I'm the Division Director for Human Development and Disability within the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities here at CDC. And I'd like to welcome you on behalf of my center director, Dr. Colleen Boyle, as well as um, the, the staff here that have been working on this issue, um, to this meeting sponsored by CDC in collaboration with the American Academy of Pediatrics. The National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities has a long history of working with AAP on emergency and non-emergency situations, all with the common goal of bettering the lives of babies and children. We work every day at our center around birth defects prevention and re research, understanding developmental disabilities, protecting people with blood disorders, and improving health for people with disabilities. And the Zika response, as we'll learn over the next two days, really embodies all of these areas. We've been all hands on deck at the Emergency Operations Center since it was activated early this year. Uh, we have, have uh, from our center, have had almost half of our staff either detailed full-time or part-time uh, in efforts working on this response. And in addition to the work of our center, the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities, there are, of course, m many centers and offices, in fact, probably every single one of them here at CDC working on this response. Our purpose over the next day and a half is to discuss the clinical evaluation and management of infants born in the United States with congenital Zika virus infection from birth to one year, and to inform the interim guidance on appropriate care and support for vulnerable infants and their families. Today's Zika outbreak is unprecedented. Never before in history has a bite of an infected mosquito resulted in a devastating birth defect. Uh, Zika virus infection is, recognize, is a re recognized cause of microcephaly and other serious brain anomalies. However, the full spectrum of the effects of Zika virus infection during pregnancy has not been fully recognized. As of July 7, 2016, there are 346 pregnant women in the United States and NDC and 303 pregnant women in the U.S. territories with laboratory evidence of possible Zika virus infection. Nine infants with birth defects have been born to women who had Zika infection in pregnancy in the United States. We are literally learning more about Zika every day, and the CDC continues to evaluate all available evidence and to update recommendations with new information that becomes available. As more infants are identified with congenital Zika uh, virus infection, interim guidance is needed to help healthcare providers to determine appropriate medical and developmental evaluation and management of these infants. And of course, that's why you all are here today, because we need the expertise here to help inform this. We value the input and collaborations of our stakeholders and partners and are happy that you can join us here today and look forward to the important conversations that are going to go on over the next couple days. And now I'd like to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Fan Tate. She's the Associate Executive Director at the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Director of the Department of Child Health and Wellness. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. Um, wow. She gave the background on that. I'm here to say thank you. All right. From the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, I will tell you our work with CDC and with other uh, federal partners, with other organizations around Zika, has been um, a great privilege. Um, it's so important, and I think you all being here speaks to the importance, right? Just so you know, to pull off a meeting like this in what? Three weeks, <laughs> four weeks max, we started talking about that, takes a, re a remarkable amount of work from the CDC, also from our staff at the Academy. But what I've been most, um, not surprised, 
but most honored by, is when we ask you all to come, you said yes. You know, in a three-week, essentially a three-week period of time, we know you have day jobs, <laughs> night jobs, weekend jobs, families. And we, we actually talked about whether we could ask people to come in, in this short period of time. At the Academy, we are always trying to give, we don't always, but we're trying to give two months, three months time when you're scheduling something like this. And I tell you, when Laura put out the call, or we all did, I would say, uh, unless there was an emergency from the people that we asked, you're here. So I... Um, I'm so honored to be a part of not just the Academy and the pediatricians here, but all of you here. So this is so important. I was thinking about what I might say for um, just a minute or two, and we need to get to work, so it's not going to go much longer. Not much longer, Sonia. But I also wanted to just call out um, family voices, right? And because when we have any meeting like this, we're so grateful to have family. Wave your hand, Jennifer. Family, this is why we're here, right? It's for the children and for the families. And Jennifer, we're so grateful that you're here to help us to see that North Star of what we can do that would be the best for the, for the children and families, right? Um, I'd also like to uh, thank you all for being on calls prior to this meeting right, to get here. But there's so much to do. Um, we thank you. If I, if I haven't had a chance to, I'm pretty much a hugger. If I haven't hugged you or at least had the opportunity to shake your hand, please know how much it means to all of us that you're here. And Sonia, thank you and so many others for the leadership. Thank you, y'all. We'll be talking. Thank you to Georgina and to Than and to all of you for being here today. Um, I'm just going to give a few brief remarks and then we're going to get started because as Fan noted, we have a lot of work to do today and we've already been working hard before this meeting. So our top priority at CDC at, as part of the Zika response efforts is to protect pregnant women and their babies. And many of these efforts have been focusing on preventing Zika infection in pregnant women. We've issued travel guidance, uh, encouraging women or asking women not to travel to affected areas. And for women who must travel to or who live in an area with active Zika transmission, we have given guidance on ways to prevent mosquito bites and to prevent sexual transmission. However, as of July 7th, and there will be new numbers coming out today, and I, um, they are uh, bigger than this, but already there are more than 650 pregnant women who have evidence of possible Zika infection in the United States and its territories. So we have a lot of work to do. Because of this, there's an urgent need to develop interim guidance for the evaluation and management of infants born with congenital Zika virus infection to give these children the best chance to reach their full potential. CDC, in collaboration with our partners and other investigators across the globe, are working as quickly as possible to collect data on the effects of congenital Zika infection. However, at this time, these data are severely limited. Therefore, it's essential that we work with experts in children's health and development to gain individual input to inform this interim guidance. We are grateful to colleagues from the American Academy of Pediatrics. They've been fantastic. Um, I still remember with the day we called them and asked them about this, and they didn't say, are you kidding? So, um, who have worked with us rapidly to plan this meeting. Together, we have invited you here today to convene a broad range of nationally recognized experts who can provide us with individual expertise to help us with the development of this guidance. And before we begin, I'd like to enjoy, join uh, Georgina and Fan in thanking you for taking time out of your busy sub summer schedules to be here. Briefly, I'd like to outline the plan for the meeting. This morning, we'll have a series of talks to make sure that we're all familiar with Zika virus, its epidemiology, and what is already known about the prenatal effects on the infants with Zika virus, including the effects on the brain and the eyes. Then this afternoon, we're going to assemble into breakout sessions for discussions. There will be three breakout groups. Um, please stick with the one that you're assigned to. The rooms are really tight. Um, we have just enough space, so if you, if you swap rooms, um, you might have to sit on somebody's lap. 
Um, that's not a good thing. Um, and we will reconvene at the end of the day for each group to briefly present the summaries of their breakout discussions and also discuss any issues, overlap issues, or things that we're concerned about. Then tomorrow morning, we'll get back together again for a more formal discussion with slides to summarize where we're at. We'll go back into breakout groups, and then we'll get together at the end of the day. Um, because of the limitations on breakout session space, we had to place limits on the number of people that could attend this meeting. There was a lot of people that wanted to attend that weren't able to attend. And therefore, um, I wanted to just make you aware that these full group sessions are being webcast, um, live streaming on the web. So um, for those that are participating uh, by webcast, if you have questions, um, we'll be taking those by email. And we have someone here that'll be monitoring that box and we'll be taking those questions at the end of the morning. The email box is congenitalzika, uh, dot, uh, sorry, congenitalzika at cdc.gov. When you send questions, please include your name and your professional affiliation. We may not have time to answer all the questions, but we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the morning session, and then um, we'll answer the rest after the meeting. For media questions, there's a separate place for media. Um, please email media at cdc.gov. After the meeting, we're planning to uh, compile and synthesize the individual input that we received from experts here today. And this in, in, uh, input will inform the development of interim guidance that will be published in CDC's Morbidity, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, or MMWR. And we realize that these will be interim guidance, that they'll be updated as more information becomes available. So um, just some housekeeping items. If you need to go to the restroom, it's out that door there. Go to the right, and then it's the first uh, um, hallway to the right, and then they'll be on your left. Um, and with no further discussion, um, I want to introduce Dr. Mark Fisher, and he's going to be giving the first talk on uh, Zika virus epidemiology. Mark is a medical epidemiologist here at CDC's Arboviral Disease Branch. Thank you, Sonia. Good morning, everyone. Um, Sonia said I'm an epidemiologist in the arboviral diseases branch, and I'm just going to give a brief overview of uh, some information epidemiology on Zika virus, which probably everyone is already familiar with. So the objective is to update the epidemiology of Zika virus in the Americas and the United States. Just for quick review, Zika virus is an RNA flavivirus. It's related to dengue, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, and West Nile viruses. And it's transmitted to humans primarily by the Aedes stegomyia species mosquitoes. Typically causes asymptomatic infection or a mild dengue-like illness. But recent outbreaks, as we'll discuss, have identified new modes of transmission and clinical manifestations. These are the principal vectors of Zika virus in the Americas. Aedes aegypti is the primary vector, also the vector of chikungunya and, and dengue and uh, yellow fever. Aedes albopictus is also a competent, although uh, less efficient vector likely for transmitting to humans for various reasons. Uh, these vectors also transmit dengue and chikungunya. They lay their eggs in peri-domestic water containers and live in and around households, and their peak feeding time is during the day, although they can also uh, bite at night. Aedes aegypti is more efficient for transmitting the virus to humans because it tends to live in and around humans primarily. It bite human, bites humans more than Aedes albopictus, which bites um, other animals as well. And then Aedes aegypti is an interrupted feeder, so it can bite multiple people during a single blood meal and therefore transmit to various people during a single blood meal. This slide shows the approximate geographic range of Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus in the United States. So this is not uh, where the vector necessarily is, but the possible range of that. And so the brown shows the overlap of the two uh, species of mosquitoes. The yellow shows areas where Aedes aegypti might be alone. And then the blue shows areas where Aedes albopictus may be alone. Um, in addition to vector-borne transmission, uh, a number of other non-mosquito-borne modes of transmission have been identified now, including intrauterine transmission resulting in congenital infection, most importantly for this meeting, intrapartum from viremic mother to newborn, sexual transmission, laboratory exposure, and likely uh, blood transfusion. In addition, there's possible transmission through organ or tissue transplantation and breast milk, and there's also a current investigation of uh, possible transmission through close personal contact uh, during a, a fatal case currently in Utah. 
As far as clinical course and outcomes, most infections are asymptomatic and the clinical illness is usually mild. Uh, most characteristic findings are fever, rash, arthralgia, or conjunctivitis. Symptoms typically last for several days to a week. Severe disease requiring hospitalization is uncommon and fatalities are rare, although have been reported. The newly identified clinical manifestations are microcephaly and other congenital anomalies, which we'll hear a lot more about today. Uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome and other neurologic syndromes are being identified and reported. And then thrombocytopenia has been reported in a uh, small number of cases. Um, Distinguishing Zika uh, from dengue and chikungunya viruses is important. Um, the, the viruses are transmitted, as we said, for, by the same mosquitoes with a similar ecology. They can circulate in the same area and likely rarely can cause some co-infections. Uh, the diseases have similar clinical features. Most importantly, as far as dengue, it's important to rule it out because proper clinical management with dengue can improve the uh, outcome. And at the bottom of the slide there, I have the, the link to the uh, WHO Dengue Clinical Management Guidelines. So as far as Zika virus diagnostic testing, uh, RT-PCR should be performed uh, for viral RNA in serum that's collected less than seven days after illness onset, and urine collected less than 14 days after illness onset. And these uh, guidances are, you know, continually being uh, revisited and uh, um, updated as needed as we have new information. Uh, in addition, evaluating RT-PCR for viral RNA and amniotic fluid and semen appears to be useful, but the, the full implications of finding the RNA in those specimens is, is unclear. Uh, serology for IgM and then neutralizing antibodies can be performed in serum and cerebrospinal fluid, and immunohistochemical staining, or IHC, and RT-PCR can be performed for viral antigens and RNA in tissues, including placenta. Serologic diagnosis is difficult. The Zika virus serology can be positive due to antibodies against some of the other related flaviviruses, dengue in particular, uh, and including uh, somebody who's received yellow fever vaccine or previously vaccinated, with the, uh, previously infected with the yellow fever virus. Neutralizing antibody testing is more specific and may be able to discriminate between these cross-reacting antibodies when it's a primary flavivirus infection, meaning the first time somebody has been infected with any flavivirus. However, it's difficult to distinguish the infecting virus, particularly in people who are previously infected or vaccinated with a, a related flavivirus. So moving on to the epidemiology, the virus itself was first uh, isolated from a monkey in the Zika forest in Uganda in 1947. Before 2007, there were only sporadic human disease cases reported from areas of Africa and Southeast Asia. And then in 2007, the first outbreak was reported from Yap Island in the Federated States of Micronesia. And after that, there were subsequent outbreaks in the uh, Pacific in particular, islands in the Pacific. And in 2013 to 15, there were more than 30,000 suspected cases reported from French Polynesia and other Pacific islands. As far as the Americas, in May 2015, the first locally acquired cases in Brazil uh, in the Americas were reported from Brazil with transmission likely occurring uh, for some time prior to that. And then as of July 14, 2016, local transmission has now been reported in 40 countries or territories in the Americas and further spread to other countries in the region is likely. This map shows, as of today, areas with uh, ongoing or active transmission, uh, with primarily being in the Americas and then some other countries uh, or territories outside the Americas. Moving on to the Americas specifically, locally transmitted uh, cases from those 41 countries uh, and territories. As of July 14th, this is from January 1st, 2015 through July 14th, 2016, there have been more than 500,000 cases reported from the Americas. Only 20% of those cases have been laboratory confirmed. The remainder are suspect cases. You can see the by far the largest number of cases have been reported from Brazil, followed by Colombia, and then a list of several other uh, countries. This shows a breakdown of those suspected and confirmed locally transmitted cases in the Americas by region, which you can see the, the largest proportion are from uh, South America, as you saw, with most of them accounted for by Brazil and Colombia. Uh, the next uh, followed by that, uh, the Caribbean region, and then Central America. 
As far as the United States, local mosquito-borne transmission of Zika virus has not been reported in the continental United States, although uh, non-travel-related cases currently be investigated in Florida. In 2011 through 2014, 11 laboratory-confirmed cases were identified in travelers returning to the U.S. from areas with uh, local transmission. And then with current outbreaks in the Americas, cases among U.S. travelers have increased substantially. And these imported cases may result in virus introduction and local spread in some areas of the U.S. that have the competent vectors or through sexual transmission. This shows, as of July 13th, the numbers of cases reported uh, in U.S. states and territories um, from January 1st, 2015 through July 13th. So there have been 1,316 travel-associated cases, with 1,305 of those reported from U.S. states. Travel-associated here includes the travelers themselves, their sexual contacts, or infants who were infected in utero, in utero and a pregnant woman who was traveling. As far as locally acquired cases, these are all so far from the territories, with the bulk of them being from Puerto Rico, as you see, 96% of those. These are presumed to be local mosquito-borne transmission, but obviously in a place where there's active, ongoing mosquito-borne transmission, you cannot uh, distinguish what might be sexual transmission. In addition, there has been one additional case reported from a U.S. state that was acquired through laboratory transmission through a needle stick and a worker who was working with a live viral culture. This shows the breakdown of the state of residence of the U.S. travel-associated cases. This is the 1,305 travel cases. You can see about 45% of the cases are accounted for from two states, uh, New York State and Florida, followed by California, Texas, New Jersey. And this shows the epidemiologic curve of these cases over time. You can see that the cases uh, were still increasing through June, and we imagine they will still uh, be up in July. This is just uh, reporting artifacts so far through the uh, July 13th date. But you can see cases were uh, began to be reported at the end of last year, uh, increased over the first uh, quarter of the year, and have now thus far peaked in June. Shows a breakdown of the sex of the, the cases, uh, with about two-thirds of them being uh, female. Uh, presumably, this is somewhat a testing bias of people testing for women who are uh, pregnant or concerns about pregnancy, uh, but requires further evaluation. This shows a breakdown of the age groups of the cases. So you could see the, the majority of cases have been in adults, in particular in uh, younger adults from 20 uh, uh, up through 60, essentially, which probably reflects, again, mostly travel-related uh, and traveling age. Uh, a little over 100 cases have been reported in people uh, under the age of 20. Shows the clinical signs and symptoms of those travel associated cases. And you can see the two most common symptoms reported being uh, fever and rash, followed by arthralgia. Uh, in about half the patients had conjunctivitis, and about a third of the patients, although you can see about half of those patients uh, have unknown status regarding their uh, arthralgia and conjunctivitis, so the number may actually be uh, a little higher than that. So moving on to current guidance, who should be tested for Zika virus infection? The, the current recommendations are that patients with fever, rash, arthralgia, or conjunctivitis who may have been exposed to Zika virus through travel to an area with ongoing transmission or an epidemiologic link to another laboratory-confirmed case, either through uh, vertical transmission, sexual contact, or association in time and place, should be tested for Zika virus uh, infection. In addition, testing should be offered to asymptomatic pregnant women who have a history of either travel or residence in an area with ongoing transmission or had sexual contact with a partner who had symptoms of Zika virus uh, during or after return from travel to an affected area. CDC has worked with state health departments to establish strategies to identify possible local transmission uh, in the United States. This includes doing surveys of household members and neighbors of travel-associated uh, confirmed cases. Blood donor screening is being performed in some areas of uh, the United States. 
investigations of unusual clusters of rash illness may identify uh, some local transmission or expanded testing of people who have had no known exposure but have a more specific constellation of clinical findings is being performed in some areas. So for example, some places will test a person who has not traveled but have three or four of the uh, typical symptoms of fever, rash, arthralgia, or conjunctivitis. In addition, uh, when and if there is a, a case of local transmission, uh, we've worked with health departments to establish strategies to identify additional uh, cases and to define the geographic scope of the outbreak. So this includes surveying of household members and neighbors within a 150-yard radius or so around the case. That's basically the flying radius of the primary vector mosquitoes. Um, notifying local healthcare providers and laboratories of the possibility of local transmission to increase their awareness uh, and look for additional cases. Syndromic surveillance is being performed in some areas for uh, evidence of increased febrile or rash illness and changes in the, from the, the status or baseline. Uh, Laboratory-based surveillance for Zika virus or other arboviruses that may be mistaken for Zika virus is being performed. Uh, community outreach is being performed in many areas to increase the community's awareness and to look for cases. As I mentioned, blood donor screening is being performed in some areas. And mosquito surveillance is performed uh, secondarily only uh, essentially around cases to look for evidence of possible local transmission. So finally, uh, as far as reporting uh, cases, Zika virus disease and congenital uh, Zika virus infection are now nationally notifiable conditions. The Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists approved an interim case definition at the end of February 2016, and a revised definition was just approved a few weeks ago at their uh, uh, annual meeting in June and will be posted on their website uh, hopefully very shortly. Um, Healthcare providers are encouraged to report suspected cases to their state or local health department to provide assistance with investigation and laboratory testing. And then state health departments should report laboratory confirmed cases to CDC according to those CST case definitions. And pregnant women and congenital infections are being followed through the US Pregnancy Registry both here in US states and in Puerto Rico. Uh, and timely reporting to these health departments allows further assessment uh, of the um, risk of infection and possible transmission to reduce further the risk of local transmission, uh, local transmission and to mitigate the risk of further spread. I think that's all. Yes. Uh, Michael Stahl, University of Chicago. I hope everyone can hear me. What about seasonality? So, um, the peak in Brazil, what's the peak of mosquito season? What's the, how does that translate into our tracking and surveillance efforts? Right. So obviously, uh, for the experience we've had so far in the Americas, we don't know the seasonality. We can only base it based on when the vectors are most active and things like dengue, for which we have you know, known seasonality. So basically, in the continental United States and subtropical areas, the seasonality is, would be typical for other mosquito-borne viruses. So we're in the peak of it now. Uh, it would begin at sort of late spring. Transmission would peak around this time uh, into late summer and then presumably uh, wane towards the sort of late summer, beginning of fall. In other more tropical areas, we really don't know the seasonality right now. It usually varies by wet and dry season uh, rather than necessarily temperatures, although in places like Brazil, they do have a winter and there is a seasonality to dengue and we're in that low season currently. Do you think that's in part due to the low, the dropping incidents in the states, the the July data? Oh no, I think the July data is just uh, where we haven't yet had reporting. I think for July, you know, those those data are as of July 13th. There's a several week delay in reporting into our national arboviral surveillance system. So I don't think we can say whether July will be higher or lower than June at this point as far as travel associated cases. Thank you for your presentation. Can you just comment on, on breastfeeding? Sure. And what's, what we know about that? That was 
Sure. Okay. So Zika virus RNA has been identified in breast milk, and there's a report, I believe two case reports of live virus being um, identified in breast milk out of French Polynesia. There have been no uh, documented known uh, cases of transmission through breast milk, but uh, that is a possibility. At this point, we believe that the risk is low enough and the benefits of breastfeeding are, are high enough that we still are recommending uh, breastfeeding for women who are uh, living in and possibly exposed to or even infected with Zika virus. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, I don't know if I, this is working, but um, uh, do, do you know anything yet about the uh, characteristics of the virus? I mean, we've seen some dendrograms about the, the, the uh, split from the African lineage, but is there anything that you know that's different about, say, uh, the viruses that are involved so far um, compared to uh, right. baseline? So, so far, all of the viruses that have been isolated uh, in the Americas, including from travelers in the United States, have been of the Asian lineage. They've been very, all of them very closely uh, related with very few genetic differences, and they've all been very closely related to previous isolates from uh, the Asian strain, mostly, for example, from that 2007 YAP outbreak, there have not been any differences. So at least right now, there's no evidence of a change in the virus itself as far as for what we're seeing. I think there's a lot more to be done yes. on that, obviously. Yeah. So suspecting and testing for the, the, um, the virus in Puerto Rico, uh, we have found since 80% are asymptomatic. Well, the social history helps us a lot. And when you mentioned the, the factors that sometimes the, the patient comes, headaches and general malaise are sometimes one of the things that can uh, lead you to suspect. And when you ask relatives if they have had the rash, the, the fever, or anything, then if, if one of them at the, uh, has, is positive, you know, we try to test them. Because uh, due to the high uh, percentage of people who present no, no symptoms, uh, you have to, uh, the social history is very important when trying to, uh, to pinpoint uh, who's positive. Thank you. Yes, and I, I think a point to highlight there is there is likely, as with dengue, clustering in households because these mosquitoes are so closely associated in households, although the data for Zika specifically are not there yet. But thank you very much. Good question. I have two questions. One, I actually like to follow up on what you said. I, um, I'm a physician who practices in Southern California and I care for pregnant women. And uh, a lot of patients either have traveled to Central or South America right before they got pregnant or during pregnancy, but they have no symptoms and their spouse, as far as they're aware, have had no symptoms. But you were t talking about that there's so much asymptomatic infection. So I'm just wondering, are we going to move to some point where we actually just recommend testing all pregnant women? who have a travel history or a partner with a travel history even without symptoms or we're not there yet? Or? So I think there'll be more discussion about testing of pregnant women and some updates to the guidance of it, but, uh, of testing pregnant women. But right now the recommendations are to test pregnant women who have a known exposure either through travel or through sexual contact and to offer testing to asymptomatic women who also have known exposure who have either pregnant women who have traveled or again, have sexual contact, but not routine screening of all pregnant women in the United States where there's no known ongoing transmission. Utah with the caregiver. Yeah, I think uh, there's not a whole lot more that I can say right now. The investigation is ongoing. Again, it was a, a very unusual situation with a fatal case, which obviously is very uncommon. So the, the uh, primary case was uh, much sicker than, than most cases and had some other extenuating circumstances and that there uh, is a, an apparent case that had close personal contact with that person and the mode of uh, possible transmission is still being investigated. Um, do you have evidence that uh, efforts that control dengue will also work for this? So there's no data to that effect, right? Because 
the control efforts are still ongoing, but there's no reason to believe that the same efforts for dengue wouldn't control this as far as the mosquito-borne transmission, right? There are some unique aspects of this virus regarding sexual transmission uh, and congenital transmission, which can occur with dengue, but you know, not to this extent. But for mosquito-borne transmission, it's the same mosquitoes, the same ecology, so the same control efforts should be effective. So I've asked this question to a lot of people. Do we, is there um, any way to detect uh, Zika virus exposure in the newborn blood spots that would be collected as a part of newborn screening? So that, that's a difficult question, and I'm not a laboratory person. There are some difficulties in the performing the assays on the blood spot itself, right. which there are groups that are working on that. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, there's the issues of which will be discussed here this afternoon, the interpreting, uh, interpretation of those results. So that would not be any different than performing it on a specimen collected from venipuncture, but you need to interpret the serologic and PCR results. But right now, I think the primary limitation is just the technical limitations of performing the assays, in particular the serologic assay on the blood spot. The assays are not validated for that specimen at this time. If, if you could, obviously, it would be a great um, means for population-based um, surveillance or assessment of broad-based exposure at the, in a pretty effective Correct. way, With the, but you, need, you really need a good test to do yeah, that. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> the limitation of the serologic assay. So for PCR yeah. testing, I think that would be very useful. That's likely to be positive if the baby was infected perinatally, right. possibly not if they were infected in utero. Yeah. Thank you. Currently, well, we're trying that in Puerto Rico because we have five years of back that we could go to the, the, those tests and see if Zika has had come previously. And they're trying to see if it, it is possible because if it is possible and it had come and no I mean, microcephaly and these things uh, hadn't uh, shown up, then it would change the whole ball game. Correct. In Puerto Rico, you're going to have that particular problem of cross-reactivity with dengue if you're doing a serologic assay. Yeah. yeah. the general availability of the PCR kind of in, in the U.S. Uh, in terms of health departments or in, in, in commercial labs? Right. So uh, PCR assays were developed at CDC, one in Fort Collins and one in Puerto Rico, and those assays have been distributed uh, to uh, all of the state health departments and other public health laboratories in the United States. And there are now commercial laboratories that are performing the testing. Changes very quickly, so I don't know exactly how many currently, but the PCR assay is widely available at this point in the United States, both through public health health laboratories and through some commercial labs. The serologic testing is a little more limited. That's being performed currently only through public health laboratories, but there are uh, several commercial laboratories that have assays that may be available soon. Yes? What is, what is the cost associated with testing pregnant women? Uh, I do not know that. Does anybody else know the... No, there is no cost when performed at public health laboratories, I guess I can tell. I don't know the cost associated at commercial laboratories. Okay. Sorry. Um, I know you may not be able to answer, but is there a strategy that one might do urine testing for this as well as other diseases of STDs in pregnant populations that might be a strategy? Uh, to uh, for early detection and populations at risk. Right. So some of the uh, you know ongoing evaluation of laboratory diagnostics is looking for better diagnostic specimens or alternative, which includes urine. Uh, urine appears to be. Um, a good specimen for molecular testing, certainly in the first week to two weeks after symptom onset or exposure, and maybe a uh, good further, you know, beyond that, there may be other specimens that also could be uh, positive or useful for longer periods of time. So in that sense, urine would, is a recommended specimen for diagnostic testing for the first couple of weeks um, after onset. Whether it could be used for screening depends on how long somebody would have RNA in urine, and we really just don't know that. So if you had a pregnant woman who was several months out from her exposure or onset, we don't know what the usefulness of doing molecular testing in urine would be at this time. This may be covered later on, but 
Are there any efforts to look at the genetic modification of the mosquito that carries a vector? Um, so as far as for... Uh, for reproduction of mosquitoes? Yeah, so there are a number of genetically modified mosquitoes that have been developed uh, for 80s mosquitoes to reduce transmission of dengue and chikungunya, and those are being employed in certain areas, and again, because it is the same mosquitoes, same ecology could potentially be an effective use for Zika virus, but those are really still in kind of evaluation and, and pilot phases right now are not being used in large scale uh, prevention efforts. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, the next three talks are going to be about clinical manifestations in infants with uh, Zika, congenital Zika infection. And this first one is, uh, was put together and was so, so supposed to be delivered by Dr. Cindy Moore. And um, she got called to a meeting uh, at WHO, a WHO meeting in Brazil. And so she's unable to be here today, and so I'm going to be speaking on her behalf. I think what we'll do is we'll give these three talks together together. Um, my talk, Dr. Dravathan's, and Dr. Ventura's, and then we'll all answer them t questions, the three of us together, if that's okay. So uh, I'm going to be talking about congenital Zika syndrome, and um, as I think most of you know, the the um, manifestations in infants that have been, uh, for which a causal relationship has been established, are the microcephaly and serious brain anomalies. So in April, CDC. Um, we published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine um, where we stated that we felt that uh, Zika virus is a cause of microcephaly and serious brain anomalies. But what we know from other teratogens, for example, thalidomide, um, uh, Accutane, uh, and rubella, is that what you see initially is usually the tip of the iceberg. And so we expect that there will be other levels, other more mild um, features, or even some that are more severe. And we'll be talking about those today. This talk is going to focus on the pattern, the recognizable pattern of, of anomalies that has been seen associated with Zika virus. So um, this is focusing on that little narrow part that helped uh, convince us that Zika virus is a cause of these problems, cause of birth effects. But today we'll be talking more broadly about other birth effects, developmental disabilities alone, uh, other adverse pregnancy outcomes, et cetera. So first of all, I want to talk about the mechanism, the pathogenesis that we uh, believe is involved in uh, prenatal Zika virus infection. And so we believe that the initiating factor is damage to those central nervous system cells by the Zika virus itself. So that leads to destruction of existing central nervous si system tissues, of brain tissues, and disruption of future developmental processes. Um, that leads to a loss of brain volume, uh, which ends up causing severe microcephaly, and I'll show you some pictures, um, misshapen skull with overlapping suture and re redundant scalp skin. And that's because the brain was meant to be bigger, it was growing bigger, and then the, um, the skull appears to collapse on itself, and um, therefore the skin of the scalp is redundant. There's also neurologic dysfunction, and um, severe neurologic dysfunction in these kids has been uh, reported. Hearing, vision, swallowing problems, swallowing problems to such an extent that they, uh, some kids have needed a G-tube, uh, global uh, developmental impairment, limb contractures, hypertonia, epilepsy, and extreme irritability. And this is what we have been calling the recognizable pattern or congenital Zika syndrome. So I'm just going to go through some of the parts of that. I'm going to very briefly discuss the brain and the eye, since we have real experts here to discuss that. Um, this is the cranial morphology. Um, the microcephaly, as I said, has been severe. Most um, kids with microcephaly in Brazil have had uh, head circumferences um, greater than three standard de deviations below the mean. Um, there's been a partial collapse of the skull with overlapping sutures. Um, there's been occipital bone prominence, and you can see in this, um, this drawing here 
uh, how this appears in these children with a prominence of the occipital bone here. Um, they oftentimes have a small or absent anterior fontanelle and sometimes so small that it's difficult to do a postnatal uh, cranial ultrasound. Scalp rugae, and you can kind of see in the picture here and there's some more pictures later on. This is consistent with a, a condition known as fetal brain disruption sequence. And um, this is something that was quite rare before Zika, um, and I'll show you some pictures about that. Now, not all of the babies that have had severe microcephaly have this fetal brain disruption sequence phenotype, but a good proportion of them do. So this is some information about fetal brain disruption sequence. This is from a paper that Dr. Moore published in uh, 1990. She and I both published a paper on this um, condition in 1990, which is um, um, very ironic, to, I think, to both of us. Uh, it was first described in 1984 by Russell and colleagues, but had been noted back as early as 1836. It, what appears to occur in these kids is that there is destruction of the brain, which results in a collapse of the fetal skull, microcephaly, that uh, overlapping of the uh, scalp uh, or scalp rugae, or sometimes that's called cutis vertices gerata, and uh, neurologic impairment. And the cases that have been seen in the past have been associated sometimes with infection. Um, uh, there's at least one case of cytomegalovirus or CMV infection. Um, with vascular disruption, where the baby had almost like a stroke prenatally, and with fever. But in most cases, the cause was unknown. And there was a review paper that was published in 2001 that looked at all the kids that up until that point had been reported with fetal brain disruption sequence. And at that time, there were 20 babies in the medical literature. So this is really rare before Zika. These are some pictures that Cindy has... Um, uh, gotten from her colleagues in Brazil, and here you can see the uh, scalp rugae, again, the scalp rugae, the occipital, the prominent occipital bone here, and here, and here. Here you can see with the 3D CT the, how impressive the overlapping sutures are, and then again, the occipital prominence here, uh, overlapping sutures here. Um, the brain anomalies I'm just going to briefly discuss because Dr. Trevathan is going to talk about this much more. Um, these babies have thin cerebral cortex. They have intracranial calcifications. Um, and as you know, intracranial calcifications are seen in other infections as well, but these are a, are a different um, areas. They're primarily subcortical in location. There's also been hydrocephalus, hydroanencephaly, gyral anomalies, um, polymicrogyria. Some people have said lysencephaly, but um, experts that we've talked to say it's more um, like polymicrogyria by imaging. Um, absent or hypoplastic corpus callosum, and then hypoplasia of the cerebellum or cerebellar vermis. And here are some pictures. These are uh, images that are courtesy of Dr. Bill Dobbins from the University of Washington in Seattle and Dr. Andre Passoa from Brazil. Um, here you can see at the top the uh, calcifications, the subcortical calcifications, and you can see the large um, ventricles and then uh, extra fluid in the extra axial spaces and very small cerebellum here. Ocular findings, there's been structural and anterior eye anomalies and posterior eye anomalies, and I'm going to leave all the rest of the discussion of the eye to Dr. Ventura. Um, they're also, these children have also had congenital contractures. They, in some kids, have had isolated contractures. There's been club foot. Um, there's also been kids that have had multiple congenital contractures or arthrogryposis. Um, it can be large joints, small joints, upper limbs, lower limbs, or all of the above. And this hasn't been previously associated with the fetal brain disruption sequence phenotype, so this is something that is different. It's not seen in all kids with Zika infection, but it has been seen in, in a number of them, um, even from the very first reports from Brazil, uh, the report that we published in MMWR in January. Um, they have been seen in other congenital infections like rubella and varicella. And here's just some pictures, again, from Dr. Pessoa from Brazil. Here you can see um, lower limb contractures here in the hips and the feet, again, in the lower limbs and the hips. And then here you can see upper and lower in this child here. 
Um, there are other severe neurologic sequelae that have been seen, and there's not really a lot known right now. These children are old enough to know a lot about their long-term medical and developmental outcomes, and very little is known about mortality. We know something about mortality in children with fetal brain disruption sequence, um, but not about not for these children with uh, um, Zika, congenital Zika infection. Um, there appear to be of the children that we are, are that have been reported motor and cognitive disabilities, seizures, swallowing difficulties, vision loss and hearing impairment, hypertonia, and spasticity with tremors, and irritability with excessive crying. Um, we're really at this point at an early stage, and as I said, this is something that's been seen with other teratogens when um, we identify something that causes problems when women are exposed to it during pregnancy, we recognize that early on we're really seeing the tip of the iceberg, and so we're really at a time where we're learning a lot about Zika, congenital Zika infection. We know that in some cases there have been, and um, Dr. Ventura can, has, has reported some of this, um, about brain and eye anomalies without microcephaly, but we don't know how often that occurs. There has been sensory or cranial nerve dysfunction only at birth versus later. Are there other uh, neurologic anomalies with origin in the embryonic period, or are there non-neurologic congenital anomalies? Those are all questions that would need to be answered. Um, I do want to note that there are other things that cause um, uh, what looks like congenital Zika syndrome, and so we really do need to do the laboratory testing whenever possible. Um, there are other infections that can cause uh, similar uh, features. Congenital CMV seems to be the most uh, similar phenotype, and there are some very rare genetic conditions that can cause features that are similar to that of congenital Zika syndrome. So one of the ways that CDC is working to get answers to um, uh, the, uh, what the spectrum that is seen with congenital Zika uh, infection is the U.S. Zika Pregnancy Registry. And this is a pregnancy registry. Um, this is to monitor pregnancy and infant outcomes following Zika virus infection during pregnancy. And they, that information is being used already to inform clinical guidance and public health response. This is a registry that is uh, dependent on the voluntary collaboration of state, tribal, local, and territorial health departments. And um, pregnant women with laboratory evidence of Zika virus infection and exposed infants born to these women, as well as sometimes the women might not have been identified, but if their infants have laboratory evidence of congenital Zika virus infection, then their mothers would be put into the registry as well. Um, uh, Dr. Peacock uh, mentioned these numbers earlier. These are last week's numbers. These numbers will be updated today and are um, quite a bit higher today, but this is uh, last week's numbers. Um, so, so 346 pregnant women who have uh, laboratory, any laboratory evidence of possible Zika virus infection in the U.S. 50 states and District of Columbia. Those are women that have been reported to that U.S. Zika pregnancy registry. And then you can see 303 women in the three territories, the three U.S. territories, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and American Samoa. Um, I just want to mention that the U.S. Zika pregnancy registry is used for um, collecting information on all those babies except for the babies in Puerto Rico. And for that, there's another system, and you can see just, it's written down here, the Zika Active uh, pregnancy Surveillance System, or ZAPS, that's being used in Puerto Rico. Um, and I think uh, Georgina also mentioned these numbers. These are the numbers of babies that have been noted of having poor outcomes. Most of the women have not yet delivered, and so for most women there's not information, but there have been nine live-born infants who have birth effects who we believe are related to Zika virus infection in the U.S. and District of Columbia. As um, Mark mentioned, those are all cases that were travel-associated. Um, uh, there hasn't been documentation of mosquito-borne transmission in the U.S. And pregnancy losses with birth effects, six. And then you can see the numbers for the pregnancy outcomes in the United States territories. So I just want to acknowledge, uh, first of all, Dr. Moore for putting together this talk, and then uh, the, the um, kind use of information, photographs, and imaging from Drs. Pessoa, Fonseca, Ventura, and Dobbins. And I think we'll just go straight into Dr. Trevathan's talk. So um, Dr. Trevathan is uh, 
professor, in professor of Pediatrics and Neurology at Vanderbilt, and he's also representing the American Academy of Pediatrics Section on Neurology, and he's going to be talking about neurologic manifestations of congenital Zika infection. I'm going to get your slides up. So. Oh, okay. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I'm going to uh, dive into some areas that I think uh, have been alluded to by, both by Dr. Peacock and Dr. Rasmussen and talk about how we may be seeing just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I know we all hope that, that what the iceberg we're not seeing yet is, is not too problematic, but I am going to take the liberty to do what we sometimes do in neurology and take a look at some pathology and some animal models and some of what we know already from, from uh, human data that Dr. Rasmussen has eloquently uh, reported and, and describe what I think is at least likely, possible to likely, that we uh, will be seeing as clinicians, as neurological manifestations in children, not just the children that we know about now, but perhaps those that we'll be seeing uh, in the future. I'll be making some real broad uh, generalizations based on at least my review of the literature and discussion with, uh, with experts, uh, but then also drilling down uh, selectively uh, in some areas that I think uh, might be helpful for us to think uh, a bit more. And I think consistent with, uh, with what uh, Dr. Rasmussen has just presented, the data that we have to date are really consistent with the idea that there are at least two broadly defined mechanisms that we're seeing. And, and it's more complicated than that. I mean, I understand we have geneticists in the room, and there's some evidence that uh, Zika actually is impairing uh, some of the uh, uh, manifest uh, gene expression, and, and that could be one of the important mechanisms. But in general, there's a disruption of brain development that uh, that is taking place in addition to disruption of already uh, developed uh, brain tissue. And these are there's evidence in the pathology that these two independent mechanisms, broadly speaking, are occurring uh, simultaneously or at least in the same in the same infant at different times. I think there's uh, an impression, that there's some very important immunologic mechanisms. Perhaps uh, cytokines could be playing an important role. And that's important for us thinking about some of the neurological manifestations because uh, having an inflammatory response in addition to disruption of development, in addition to uh, damage of previously developed brain, does have certain implications in terms of what we may expect uh, to see later. Now, one of the reports that's come out, it's a tragic report that also there have been other cases that have been uh, shared with several of us in neurology from Brazil in which there's been uh, hydranencephaly or just really a replacement of previously developed brain by fluid. Uh, tragically, many of us who trained clinically years ago uh, remember that before imaging, this was easy to diagnose. All you did was take the baby into a dark room, put a flashlight up against the skull, and the head lights up like a light bulb because there's really no uh, or very little brain tissue in there, and the light is just distributed through the fluid. And that is actually what has been reported by Sarno and colleagues. Now, I added the uh, blue arrow there up there under... Uh, uh, the, uh, the image uh, in A, to make a couple of points, that's really the fluid that's, been repl that's replacing the brain tissue. But if you look, you can see that there's a dramatic asymmetry. All right, so <clears throat> the, uh, there's one hemisphere that's been almost completely replaced by fluid, another hemisphere that's severely damaged, uh, but yet there's still some cortex uh, that's intact and in spite of uh, all of the damage that's there. And I think that this asymmetry uh, and some of the other developmental findings we're seeing are, are, are going to, to be helpful in understanding what we're going to see in the future. Now, a real breakthrough in understanding the uh, developmental 
uh, abnormalities uh, with, with Zika occurred uh, <clears throat> with the publication of the group uh, by, from Hopkins, Tang, and, and others uh, reported in Cell Stem Cell that the uh, Zika virus actually directly uh, invaded uh, human neural progenitor cells and actually reproduced within the cells. In some cases, there was actual inducing uh, cell death. In others, there was dis disruption of, of cell function, uh, cell cycles, and, and then transcription within these human neural progenitor cells. <clears throat> now, as an aside, this, this, uh, this type of abnormality in these human neural progenitor cells has been associated in other types of uh, models with disruption both globally and also more focally of uh, neuronal migration and cortical development as well as subcortical uh, abnormalities. It's also been the case that these findings have already been reproduced. I think one of the, the uh, happy sides of the Zika story scientifically is the absolutely impressive rapid response of science to address this problem. The eloquent research that's been published already in a short amount of time is impressive. So Tang's uh, and colleagues' findings have already been uh, reproduced and actually taken forward so that they're seeing now more specific findings in in vitro models of brain development looking at how Zika uh, impairs development of ne human neurospheres and human brain organoids. Now, one of those articles in uh, Garchez just recently, and colleagues published this, and even those of us who are not basic neuroscientists, laboratory neuroscientists, you can see the difference in the sphere there in, uh, in uh, the A uh, image, uh, perfectly round, uh, normal-looking human uh, neurosphere, and then in B, it's shrunken, mouse-shaped and is just not forming or developing uh, adequately. And that is very clearly an abnormality that uh, is seen in models in which there's abnormal uh, development uh, of the neurons and uh, migration of neurons, both globally and in some cases uh, more focally. Here's another uh, image from Garchez um, looking at a human brain organoid uh, models, and it's very clear uh, in this model that uh, Zika virus uh, disrupts and impairs the normal development of this uh, in vitro model of human brain development. Now, <clears throat> an article that also is fairly recent in Nature, uh, Kugola and colleagues showed that there's an animal model a mouse model for uh, causing microcephaly uh, that's very clearly directly causally related to the infection of Zika virus uh, with invasion and disruption of uh, uh, progenitor cells. And you can see in the picture of the, the uh, uh, mouse uh, fetuses that there's not only uh, really a microcephaly, but also just a major growth restriction. And this has uh, received quite a bit of uh, attention. But what I'd like to draw your attention to is not just that, not just that there's overall uh, small brain, small size of the, the body, but there uh, is a very specific disruption of cortical development in the temporal lobe and in the motor cortex. I don't know that they did a survey of all areas of the cortex, but clearly shown in the temporal and the, and the motor areas of the frontal lobes in these uh, animals, there's abnormal uh, cortical uh, development and also uh, there appears to be uh, uh, disruption of, of the, the normal uh, cortical um, morphology. Uh, also, uh, there's been an article uh, from uh, Lee and colleagues that uh, likewise has demonstrated this, uh, this small uh, brain microcephaly as a model in, in, uh, in mice. And in this case, they, it was not the Brazilian strain, it was an Asian strain 
of Zika virus uh, causing this abnormality. And then they reproduce the work of Tang and others, invasion of uh, progenitor cells. But what they have done too is to uh, describe uh, and report some of the uh, neuropathology. And again, what they've demonstrated is not just a dropout in the total number of neurons, but also disorganized cortex, a thin cortex, uh, and increased uh, neuronal uh, cell death. Again, all these findings that are seen in animal models that uh, are predictive of uh, type, certain types of abnormalities in, in humans. Now moving to some of the human data, this is from Driggers and colleagues' report in the New England Journal earlier this year of uh, a fetus who was tragically infected uh, with Zika, and they have fetal MRI as well as a fetal uh, neuropath. In the MRI, uh, one of the things that's really very clear is thinning, dramatic thinning of the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is is very clearly uh, too small and is thin. This is a large structure, relatively speaking, and something that's more obviously seen as a marker when there's severe impairment of cortical development, neuronal migration. And uh, then in the neuropath, they show disorganization uh, of the cortex. Uh, and this, again, is consistent, I would say, with the, the previous uh, animal data that's been seen. For some of us in neurology, some of what we're seeing here is reminiscent of what we've seen in CMV, as has been mentioned before. And this is uh, from some work uh, published by White uh, and in pediatric neurology recently, really more of a review of the type of imaging abnormalities that have been seen uh, with CMV. And in this situation, uh, they've, uh, pointed out in, in the image to your images to your left, really CMV being causally associated with this congenital perisylvian syndrome in which frontal and temporal lobes are, are abnormally formed, both the cortex and subcortical white matter, uh, and that there is very typically polymicrogyria uh, in the cortex around uh, the uh, perisylvian region. This again has been, is consistent with some of the neuropathology uh, from the uh, animal studies uh, in Zika, and then I think also what we've seen in some of the neuropath uh, from some of the early uh, human uh, data. There's also, uh, to, your, to your right, there's images that really emphasize a cleft uh, within the cortex. And this is the type of abnormality that also is associated with polymicrogyria within the cleft and areas of abnormally formed cortex uh, in other ways around the cleft. These types of lesions are extremely highly epileptogenic. And when occurring in a focal area of cortex, uh, very often, uh, people can appear, children can appear normal initially at birth and then develop uh, seizures in the first several months or even later uh, in life. Here's another <clears throat> picture of one of these uh, clefts uh, that has polymicrogyria uh, within uh, the walls of the cleft. And as you can see, it's dramatically asymmetric, although neither hemisphere is completely normal. But the reason I point this out is that there are uh, cases that neurologists see quite frequently in which one hemisphere can be almost completely normal and the other has a demonstrated cleft uh, with polymicrogyria within it and so forth. And sometimes these, these children can be dramatically uh, unremarkable uh, developmentally for the first several years of life and then present with seizures later on or they develop infantile spasms or hemispasms uh, very early. And so they often are not microcephalic uh, at birth. Uh, lastly, let me just show an example of some of the fine work of Ruben Kuznicki, uh, who is an adult 
uh, neurologist and epilepsy specialist at NYU. Rubin's been interested in this for over 20 years. And the reason is because if in uh, taking care of adults, young adults with intractable epilepsy with onset of the seizures in adolescence, what Rubin's uh, pointed out time and time again over the last 20 years, and it's consistent with what most of us have seen, is that one of the more common causes of intractable focal epilepsy in uh, young adults and adolescents who don't even have onset of any clear neurological symptoms until that age are these types of uh, neuronal migration abnormalities associated with clefts, polymicrogyria, and thickened cortex. And in the image that's uh, to the, the, the far right, it, there's actually an asymmetry in which one hemisphere is relatively normal, and then another hemisphere has dramatically abnormal cortex with large areas of polymicrogyria and a cleft and multiple different types, actually, of cortical uh, migration uh, abnormality. So what Dr. Rasmussen was pointing out that what we're seeing in some of the cases of Zika so far is actually technically not as consistent with lysencephaly as polymicrogyria. I agree, it does turn out to be a very important distinction and is more consistent with mechanisms that can produce these initially less severe malformations that don't manifest until later in life. And so I think one of the things we're going to have to think about in looking at Zika is realize that manifestations of a congenital anomaly may not be readily apparent for months or even years or longer. And how do we deal with that as uh, clinicians and uh, as epidemiologists, I think is going to be uh, quite a challenge. So here I've, I've uh, summarized uh, at least the way I would uh, think about uh, these issues that, w that lay ahead for us. I think the column on the left, uh, the infants that are clearly abnormal at birth, and I believe this is uh, work group uh, uh, two for us, correct? Uh, this is a tragic situation, but I think relatively easy to predict. Uh, these are children, uh, and this would include uh, the, uh, the abnormalities that Dr. Rasmussen described in, in more detail than I did, uh, children that really have profound motor cognitive impairment. Most of them will meet diagnostic criteria for cerebral palsy. They're all going to have profound with an emphasis on profound intellectual uh, disability. One thing that we don't often talk about, because these children are so severely impaired, is that they do tend to have cortical visual impairment and cortical auditory impairment. How that impacts recommendations for auditory screening and visual screening, I think, is something worth discussing. For the pediatricians, uh, one of the, the things that's a, that's a real problem that also Dr. Rasmussen brought up is that initially these babies are often able to suck, but as they become several months uh, old, they, they lose their ability to suck, lose their ability to feed. They can appear to regress uh, during that time. And I would suspect that most, if not all, these children are going to have severe problems with feeding. Hypotonia is uh, usually truncal hypotonia, it goes along with a lot of these types of abnormalities that we're seeing. And you put that truncal hypotonia, problems with gag reflex, problems with feeding together, and seizures, that really presents problems with aspirations, aspiration pneumonias, respiratory problems. Very soon uh, thereafter, uh, their pulmonologist and and hospitalists involved in the care of those children. The classic uh, situation here is onset of uh, seizures in the first few months of life. Infantile spasms tend to be real, that's a rare uh, epilepsy syndrome, tends to be relatively common among children with these types of abnormalities. And so as we educate uh, clinicians about what to expect. I think a uh, focus on uh, infantile spasms 
and uh, how to make how to recognize those abnormalities will be important. Now, of those who are initially normal, appearing at birth, uh, and again, I I don't want to play epidemiologist here, but the, I know this has got to be a discussion and concern among the epidemiologists because we don't really know uh, the number of people who've been exposed at this point, uh, but nevertheless. Among children uh, who appear normal at birth but who have one of these milder forms of developmental brain uh, problems that, we've, that I've uh, mentioned, they tend to develop what we would classify as acquired microcephaly even though the etiology uh, is developmental. And actually some of these children may actually not meet diagnostic criteria uh, for microcephaly, their head circumference may be above the second percentile, but they can have a deceleration in head growth and then also have developmental delays that are in one or more domains. And then, of course, the domain in which they have their developmental delay would be related to the neuroanatomical location of the associated uh, brain uh, malformation. It will take us quite some time to know whether there's a pattern there that we can predict. As with the children that are symptomatic at birth, uh, these children will be expected to have a higher rate of myoclonic epilepsy and infantile spasms, but as with the uh, cases that have been reported for many years from adult epilepsy centers, I think we can also expect people to be relatively asymptomatic if there's a focal uh, or even abnormality isolated to one hemisphere may not really pre uh, present until later in childhood or adolescence with seizures and what appears to be developmental regression. And then that developmental regression is often associated with an increased frequency of subclinical uh, seizures. So I think epilepsy and developmental delays are going to be important to look for in those kids that look normal at birth. Those who are uh, abnormal at birth, I think will be familiar to pediatricians who care for children with severe to profound microcephaly from multiple other causes. I don't want to end without mentioning what's already been mentioned, which is we know that uh, Zika is causally related to Guillain-Barre, both in uh, Brazil and in the in French Polynesia, and very often we think of, of uh, Guillain-Barre as being an adult uh, problem, but it's, it, uh, Guillain-Barre can also affect children. Two-year-olds, three-year-olds uh, can have Guillain-Barre, and so we'll need to make sure our, our colleagues are well-versed in Guillain-Barre. There's been a report or two of myelitis, how often this occurs, I do not know. I think that one of the more common questions I've had has been uh, what is the risk to the developing brain among children after they're born during the first two years of life if they are infected by Zika? Uh, I do not have any data on this. I don't know the answer to the question. It's one that I, I feel certain will uh, be a question that will be ongoing uh, for some time, and I'd be interested personally to know if people have data on that. I've relied very much on the work of others, um, and although my conclusions uh, are not necessarily those that have been in, in these publications I, uh, that I've listed here, I'd be happy to share these with you if, if you uh, would like. Thank you. And our next speaker is Dr. Camilla Ventura. She is an ophthalmologist at the Altino Ventura Foundation in Brazil, and she's gonna be talking about ophthalmologic manifestations. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank CDC and Dr. Rasmussen for the invitation. Um, to start with, I would like to acknowledge my team in Brazil at the Altino Ventura Foundation. For sure, this is all about teamwork, um, as well as uh, all of our partners from Brazil and abroad. They have been helping us along our way. 
Um, and for you to understand where we are stepping right now, where we are standing right now, it's important for you to understand where, how did we start and how did we get involved with uh, Zika syndrome, congenital Zika syndrome. So by October 2015, we already knew that we had cases of microcephaly in Brazil since May. Um, and that people were talking about that it was related to Zika, but we did not have anything proven. By November 2015, this association was proven to exist. And uh, as we can see here, the impact in our population in Brazil, how the peak of microcephaly just went up um, mainly between November and December, October to December, I'm sorry. And it was uh, really fast and very, very important for our country. So this was where we were standing. Also, uh, it's very important for you to know that Pernambuco, which is the red state, as you see in the map, it's located in northeast of Brazil. It was the first state to report cases of microcephaly in Brazil. And it's still considered the epicenter because it's also the state that has the most amount of cases of my, uh, congenital Zika syndrome, more than 25%. So uh, Adeltino Ventura Foundation, we are located in northeast of Brazil, and we are a nonprofit eye hospital and rehabilitation center. So we are in the capital of Pernambuco, and uh, this is a nonprofit organization. We see about 35,000 patients every month for eye care, and we perform about 2,000 eye procedures a month. So it's quite a lot. That's why we're a reference center in northeast. Um, also, the, as for the rehabilitation center, we cover, we rehabilitate patients according to their impairment, visual, auditory, uh, mo motor, and intellectual. And right now, in our rehabilitation center, we have more than 3,500 patients, and from those 256 babies uh, with, with uh, congenital Zika syndrome, they are being treated in, at our institution. And so how did we get involved with congenital Zika syndrome? It started that um, in December 2015, we organized three task forces. In total, we saw 128 babies and their mothers, because at that point, we did not know if mothers had ocular findings as well or only the babies. We found out that only babies had ocular findings. Um, the ocular exam included the ectoscopy, motility, biomicroscopy, which is the anterior segment examination, the fundoscopy, the posterior segment examination, and we performed fundus photography of all 128 babies. So uh, as for the ocular findings, now we are seeing, because uh, at birth you cannot actually diagnose uh, strabismus, and they, these strabismus, they vary until six months of age, but now these babies are growing and we are um, actually assessing the strabismus, but also the nystagmus that these babies did not have and now they're presenting with time. Um, but mainly the fundus alteration. So this is what we uh, mostly see in these uh, babies. And we were the first ones to report the retinal and optic nerve alterations, but now we see that these babies also have vasculature um, findings. So as for the retinal alterations, basically we see scars, retinal scars, as you see in this image, um, but also we can have pigmentary changes as you can see in this other image. And as for the retinal scar or atrophy, atrophy, it's very important to know that it varies uh, according to the location. So you can have, let's say, a macular lesion, you can have a nasal lesion. The size also varies. So you can have a very small, and maybe you can miss that out if you're not being observing it really well. But it can also be a very extensive lesion in the eye. The shape also varies. It can be a circular or oval lesion or can have more a disciform aspect. Um, and the number of lesions also vary. You can have an isolated scar or multiple scars. As for the pigmentary changes, we see that these babies, they can have uh, more of focal pigmentation in the macular region, but they also can have diffuse. So it really varies as well as the 
pigmentary aspect, it can be something like very fine, but also a gross modeling pigmentation. And it can be isolated, so you can see only the pigment, or it can be associated to the scar. So it really varies a lot, and we're learning from this um, very much. Also, the optic nerve findings, in this picture we see all the three findings we can find. The optic nerve hypoplasia, the pallor that we see in the optic nerve, as well as the increased cupping. So this is a very good image to show that. Um, the vascular findings we are seeing with time, so th this is one image which shows the attenuation of the vessels, um, but we were not the first ones to report the hemorrhages that these babies have. Miranda and collaborators, they have described the, these hemorrhages, as you see inferiorly, and also the abnormal peripheral vasculature that you can see superiorly, and uh, it was also reported by Miranda. Miranda. As for the interior segment alterations, from our 256 babies, we have not seen any anterior segment alteration, but it has been reported in literature, the iris coloboma, the lens subluxa subluxation, and cataracts. And also in previous, um, lit in previous papers, we have seen uh, people describing micro uh, microphthalmia, like Calvit. Um, so talking about, since we're here to discuss, this is what we're actually doing nowadays in Brazil and trying to advertise and, and make sure these babies, they have uh, an exam at least within one month of birth. Um, but also we find it very important to document these fundus because many of these babies that they are born without ocular findings because they have a central nervous system impairment, many times the optic nerve are, are changing along the way. So it's good to have the documentation of the baseline to have this comparison. And we're talking about all babies born, especially in the epidemic areas like Brazil right now. It's very hard to have this done, um, but this is something, the ideal world, right? Also, it doesn't really matter if the mother had symptoms or not, we defend that all babies should be screened really. And also, as Dr. Rasmussen said, we published a paper with, with uh, a baby that did not have microcephaly, but had other neurological and ocular findings. So it's very important to englobe all of these patients. And we also say that if the patient has an ocular finding, it's very important to refer it, the, this patient to at least a pediatric ophthalmologist. Right now, we are following these babies, um, the pediatric ophthalmologist and the retina specialist in our institutions. We're following these babies because the treatment is actually very, uh, it's multidisciplinary. And it also, you have the magnifi uh, magnifying glasses that you can use to stimulate these babies with um, patching and and therapy, visual therapy, simulation, but uh, it's also very important that the retina specialist will see the, these fundus and will detect if there is any change. So you're um, working as really a team. But also, I, we think it's not only about having a lesion or not, actually, both, uh, all babies should be followed, at least during the first year of age. And we would say we are trying to do this in, in our region where this retina specialist will uh, follow these, these babies every six months during the first year of life. Because since it's a scar and it's a past infection and all of that, it won't, we expect not to change much. So that's why the six months. And the pediatric ophthalmologist, because of the visual uh, uh, development, they are following every three months, these babies. But it's very challenging, of course. It, like I said, it's a multidisciplinary team. We have um, a, a lot of therapists, neurologists, um, ENT working with us, and it's a very costly treatment. We're going through a very difficult um, moment in Brazil with all the political and economical crisis. That's why we're gathering help from all over um, because the cause is really big. These babies need our help and it's very touching. Like I said to many of you, it's touching to deal with these patients and see how they can do better with treatment. So thank you so much for your attention. Gitane Debatti, Augusta, Georgia.
In the animal data you show there was striking in, uh, intrauterine growth restriction, but that's not been the phenotype in humans. Was there any data on the placentas of those animal models? From, are you asking about from those articles that I? Yeah. I don't recall seeing the placental data there. Now, in some of the, and I have to go back and look at the articles, but there are some of these human cases in which uh, Zika was isolated from the amniotic fluid. Um, and that was one of the ways that they documented exposure, <clears throat> for example. But I, I don't recall an actual histo uh, histopathology of the placenta itself in the, in the articles. But um, I'm not the best person to speak to that. Yes, sir. Yeah, there was an a article recently in mice uh, looking at placenta, and then there was an article that came out, I saw it yesterday, first author is T-A-B-A-T-A -T -A -T -A, uh, from human placenta. So mm. It's showing different cell types at different stages in development mm. being involved. I'm Sharon Lehman. Uh, Section on I'm the chair of the section on AAP uh, on ophthalmology, and I'm really you know very pleased that both of you uh, talked about cortical visual impairment. Just as coincidence, three weeks ago we had a pediatric cortical visual impairment meeting, uh, and then uh, this week, so uh, unless you're interested in cortical visual impairment, spoke to a group of uh, teachers of the visually impaired and early intervention people. And this was a very big topic. Uh, and many times in children who have all these neurodevelopmental uh, problems, the cortical visual impairment gets overlooked. And I think that uh, it's going to be, and, and the early intervention people at this meeting were also very concerned that the recommendations that we make uh, speak to early intervention and not just the initial uh, treatment. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up. I, I think that uh, you know, we'll have to discuss the, the follow-up in Brazil and the follow-up, at least in the United States, because as, as we spoke, uh, you know, the retina specialists are, are probably not going to be interested in seeing these children <laughs> in the United States. Uh, so I think we'll have to modify uh, you know, things to, to fit uh, clinical care uh, here. But you know, really, thank you both for bringing that up, because it uh, is so often overlooked. I totally agree with <clears throat> what you're um, saying, and that's why we want to emphasize we're following these babies, and we see that many do not reach the milestones for the age according to their age, you know, the, the vision according to the age. And this, for sure, has to do with CNS. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Georgina Picac from CDC. Uh, Ed, you talked about. Um, the loss of suck and the increase in feeding problems <coughs> over time, is that only in the children they, that are develop, would develop seizures? I know this is somewhat speculation, or do you think there's a possibility of some developmental regression in all of the babies, regardless of the development of the seizures? Yes, again, with the <clears throat> disclaimer that I'm projecting right. based on uh, other types of situations that we've seen, I think that's a separate uh, issue from the seizures. I mean, the seizures can exacerbate the overall situation because you're having a lot of seizures and you can't control your secretions, you're going to be more likely to aspirate. But um, in these children that are severely microcephalic, and I, I would say especially those <clears throat> They have severe frontal lobe dysfunction. You know, as we're, we're all designed, not overly simplistically, that as we, as our brain develops, we shift that <clears throat> from that reflex sucking mechanism to more uh, intentional uh, uh, chewing, swallowing activities that are more related to higher structures. And so, if those those higher brain structures are not intact, then they then uh, they tend to develop those more severe swallowing uh, and feeding problems after a few months of life. So I, I think it's more related to the brain injury itself, the loss of feeding than <clears throat> ability, than it is actually uh, the seizures. Okay. 
Hi, uh, this is Susan Wiley from Cincinnati, and I want to mirror thank youing about the functional vision assessment and thinking about cortical vision. But my question is actually for um, the um, babies who are not microcephalic at birth. Do we have any knowledge that there's an asymmetry of head circumference to the rest of the growth parameters, or is that not necessarily apparent to the degree that we know that? I mean, so you know, recognizing that some kids are going to have a normal head circumference but is it disparate from their somatic growth? In, in, asymp in those symptoms, those kids, so you would, you would kind of put two categories of children up, yeah. one with clear microcephaly, those without microcephaly, um, and what we should do to be thinking about them. But I'm, you know, whether there's data to suggest a relative microcephaly compared to somatic growth. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that. I, again, I'm projecting based on what we're seeing in other conditions. And I would say especially, I mean, it would be nice to know what you've seen in Brazil, but since the pathology and the imaging that we've seen can be quite asymmetric, both in terms of brain destruction and then abnormalities of, uh, of actually brain development and, you know, abnormalities in migration, when, when the, in other conditions that have that, sometimes the head size may not be technically abnormal or below the second percentile because one hemisphere is normal. And then those children are not as easy to pick up early on. Yeah, the case that we reported, uh, actually the, the, there was a cranial facial um, disproportion and also, but the head circumference, like I mentioned, was normal. Mm, but yeah. the, the brain findings the baby had uh, ventricular megaly calcification. So he had the neurological findings that has been reported. But the, you look at the baby and you see that there is a cranial facial for mm. sure. It's not something that will pass by you and you do not realize that. So one side of the face was a different side. side. It's like, um, you see that it's not... You would think, actually, that the baby has have um, a microcephaly, but once you measure it, oh, it's, it's within the growth. We are following this baby, and it keep the brain keeps following the normal curve, not within like the ninety percent. It's a little bit, but it, um, under, but not considered microcephaly. Yeah, yeah. Do you understand? Yes. And it keeps in the the curve. But you look at the baby and you see, oh, it's not, the proportions are not normal for a baby. Hmm. Hi, I'm Bob Lopez, I'm a representative of the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Special Diseases. And what's striking to me at all about this year, the, the dramatic um, microcephaly and uh, hydrocephalus at ex vacuo because of all of this uh, horrible thing. But when you look at other congenital fractures, as you pointed out, CMV and rubella, which again are, are fairly, uh, are also very phytolytic, we haven't seen those dramatic findings. And yet, I, my understanding is that there are Zika receptors throughout the brain, uh, not just in the neuronal progenitor cells. And do you do you have any idea why this is so profound um, in these in, with this virus relative to? say, uh, C CMV and uh, especially rubella, which can be quite devastating mm, yeah. in terms of the same <clears throat> cellular drop-off. I, I, others may have a different impression, but uh, no, I don't know. And, and I, I would agree. This is, to me, the, neuropath the neuropathology and imaging that we've seen so far uh, is actually much more concerning. Um, both in terms of the <clears throat> brain injuries to the babies that are microcephalic, but also I think the potential of uh, what these mechanisms could do to, to children that initially pass screens. So I, I would agree with you. This, this is a new territory. Uh, so one other comment that is that, as you know, there's also literature that suggests that um, antibody-dependent uh, enhancement, uh, for example, with uh, in, at least in vitro, looking at adding uh, dengue virus antibodies to cell in vitro models results in higher uh, cellular destruction. And whether or not there's 
some cross-reactivity uh, with that in, in fl additional inflammatory response. I think somebody else brought up this issue of inflammation. But I think yeah. that may be another cofactor that I, I don't know if that's been looked at yet. So for example, uh, women who are, I know it's hard to do, but to distinguish between dengue co-infected women versus not and whether that ADE and uh, may actually lead to additional cellular drop off. Yeah. Ep question for yeah, our epidemiologist. I knew Mark would probably. <clears throat> Um, there, there are no data that I'm aware of that. Obviously, there have been, there have been interest as to why this is being seen here now and whether previous um, dengue infections in an area, you know, could be contributing at a population level. There is the one study that you mentioned that uh, looked in vitro, Bonnie, and suggested that there could be uh, an increased severity, but I'm not aware of any data, and it is very difficult serologically okay. to find a population that is not previously dengue infected in these parts of South America and suggest that there's greater severity of disease compared to, to not. But yeah. I think it's an ongoing question. Yes, uh, Fernando Isar, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, Puerto Rico. Uh, these soft signs that you have mentioned are uh, neurological and ophthalmological, they not, do not necessarily uh, have to, uh, are <clears throat> with just microcephalic babies. Do you have any data on when was the, the mother, mother uh, infected or when was uh, uh, that Zika was diagnosed, if it was in the first tri trimester, second or third trimester of pregnancy? Yeah, so one of our publications, we wanted to see what were the risk factors associated to the ocular findings. And we actually saw that the first trimester is related. So probably um, the ocular findings, the infection occurred in the first trimester so that the baby had um, the ocular findings and consequently, I believe, the microcephaly. And also another risk factor was the cephalic perimeter. So the smaller the head circumference was at birth. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, that's, we had some signaling from the back of the room, and I think that's what he was trying to tell us. <laughs> so okay. also the, the head circumference was also another risk factor. So what makes me believe that uh, the infection occurred in the first trimester, the head stopped growing um, severely, right? And then the ocular findings also appear in the same moment. What we're seeing now in the ocular, as the ocular findings are scars. We are not seeing active disease. That's why we're, we are not um, treating these babies with uh, steroids or trying to find some treatment for the, these babies because actually now it's a past infection and we believe it was first trimester. Hi, Jennifer Goldman, from Ventura, this is for you. I know that my constituents are dying to know the answer to this. Uh, how did Brazil respond to the parents? How did you support the numerous parents um, that were having to deal with um, all, you know, the children uh, that they had to support? What was, your, what, how did your, your state, your, your country support the parents dealing with this? This, this is a great question. Right? Um, we thought it was very important to give parents support and since the beginning. We saw many mothers depressed, many of the families did not want to show their babies, they would cover their babies up, they would come with the babies covered, would leave treatment with the babies covered. They could not handle the pressure from media also and from people around, the curious people. So uh, because of that, we have uh, formed a, a support group for the mothers, basically mothers. It's, we were actually mentioning how fathers, they, in these moments, it's very hard to maintain a family when you have a baby that cannot stop crying. These babies have a neurological cry. I actually have on my phone, I have recorded their cry. It's insane. Um, and the, all the, therapies involved, because the babies, these are 256 babies, we are trying to see them weekly. It's not easy. We have, uh, like I said, a political issue and we are not being paid for these babies. Um, but we are having donations and grants. We're trying to get as many help as we can. 
and mothers have uh, responded so well to support psychological psychiatrists as well. Some of them, they need psychi psychiatrists, um, but mothers are helping themselves. So, okay, my baby cannot swallow. They, every time, like you said, I, um, they have swallowing issues. They do really do. So one mother discovered a way of feeding the baby and they're teaching, oh, so we make, Every week, while the baby is being um, treated, stimulated, ocular, um, um, motor, the mother are also being treated um, with the support group. So I find this very important. It's not only about seeing only the babies, but everything around them. It's a whole family that changes once you have a baby with congenital Zika syndrome. Um. I am not aware of, do you know whether anyone has ever looked at congenital CMV in arthrogryposis? Arthrogryposis, because we've got so many, I just, okay. <coughs> Um, it was really interesting looking at, oh, I'm sorry, Lisa Hunter. I'm at Cincinnati Children's Hospital in Pediatric Audiology and really interested in the congenital ophthalmo ophthalmology um, anomalies and thinking about parallels with the auditory system but haven't been able to find data yet. And I'm wondering from Brazil, um, with um, the testing that is done there, there are some really good ENT and audiology research facilities. Is there any data about to come out or any knowledge about what the parallels may be. I'm worried about dual sensory impairment, both hearing and vision in these children and the profound developmental effects that may occur as a result. They certainly have auditory um, findings, and we're trying, this is something that uh, the next paper we're working on is assessing, we have assessed 38 babies, and all of it has been, these babies have been assessed by ENT, um, neurology, uh, or orthopedics, um, ophthalmologists, all of them, and we want to, nobody has, no publication has come out about the auditory findings, and it's very important. The tests um, in the beginning, every, when we had the 138 babies in the beginning, we tested them with the, um, it's a screening test, I don't know in English, the, it, but it ha also has errors, so it's not so precise. You have the same, when a baby is born, you screen first and then you have the real auditory test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, had, we did not want to rely on that test. That was why we, during like a long time, we did not publish those findings. We, it took a lot to have the um, real test. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the more specific the diagnostic test. test. Yes, the diagnostic test. Exactly, the diagnostic test. But now we have from, for the 38 babies I was telling you about. So this is something we are working on for sure. They, and it's mainly one unilateral, what we are seeing. Yeah, very you curious. Yes. So I'm going to um, have the question stop so we can stay on time. Otherwise, we will um, get severely behind today. So we have a break right now for 15 minutes. If you want to ask um, Dr. Trevathan or Dr. Ventura questions during the break, that would be great. Um, and we'll come back at 10.30 uh, for the next series of talks. Thanks so much. <laughs>